Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss types of cyber attacks. We have six main categories of cybersecurity attacks, network-based attacks, host-based attacks, social engineering, application-based attacks. In this session, we will focus on application-based attacks and we still have two left, physical attacks as well as supply chain attacks. There's a lot of definitions in these lessons. The good news is this. You need to know the basic definition for the CPA exam. So if you're studying for the information systems and controls exam, go to Farhat Lectures and work MCQs. First, get familiar with the lesson, then work MCQs. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. What is application-based attack? Well, these are malicious activities that specifically target software or application. Here we're looking at either a website or a database. So the aims of these attacks is to gain unauthorized access to do what? To disrupt normal operation or the application itself. Now, there are many of those attacks, but one of the most famous one is SQL injection, is one of the most prevalent and dangerous. So let me explain what SQL injection in a simple example first. Let's assume you have a notebook where you keep track of everyone who borrows your books. You keep their name and the title of the book. Now, suppose you have a friend who instead of just telling you their name, they also ask you to do what? Add the following statement and give me the notebook. Well, what's going to happen is this. <laughs> if you do everything that what's written in that book and you do write that statement and you are not paying attention, you're going to hand over that notebook to your friend. And what's going to happen, your friend is going to know all the names of the people that borrowed the book. They end up giving you, you end up giving that notebook. So SQL injection work in a similar way. So a website might ask for, for example, a user information, just like you're asking for a name to write down in your notebook. As the, the attacker, instead of providing the real login name, they would include a tricky note, which is a malicious code. If the website isn't careful about checking what's written before it acts, in other words, execute that code, it might do such more than just log in a person. It could end up giving the attacker access to see, change, or delete all sorts of important information in the database, just like you gave away your notebook. So that's the basic idea of an SQL injection. It's a technique where the attacker exploit vulnerabilities in the application database. So instead of accessing a company database directly, which is often well protected, what you will do sometime, attack the web server that interfaces with the database. So you attack the front page, the website. You will inject malicious SQL command into the existing SQL queries that the application uses to communicate with the database. And this is done through the input of fields on a website, such as login, forms, search boxes, or URL queries parameter, where you put some code. You inject the code to get into the database. Just like you told your friend, give me your, uh, give me your notebook, and once you have access to the notebook, you can do whatever you want to. So this attack works because web application often take user input and directly include it in, the, in, in SQL queries without proper valid, validation or sanitization. So by carefully crafting the input, the attacker can manipulate these queries into executing unintended SQL command, asking the database to do something it's not intended to, to use. So these command could do anything from unauthorized data retrieval, deletion, to bypass and login authentication. If we go back to the original example, imagine a login form on a website. A normal user would enter the name, for example, John, as your login. But an attacker would enter something like a code, like anything or x equal to x. And what you're trying to do 
if the if if the website is not carefully programmed, this might looks like a legitimate request that uh, that always turns out to be true. X is always X, tricking the site into letting the attacker in without needing a correct username and password. Now this is simple. I don't know much programming, but I'm sure you got the idea where you input some code in those boxes that allows you to do something you're not supposed to do. And this is what SQL. And usually you would attack the web page, the front page, to access the database. Cross-site scripting, XSS, is a cybersecurity vulnerability that, like SQL injection, involves injection malicious code into the website. However, the SQL injection target a website's database. You're looking at the da database. XSS, the, the cross-site scripting, attacks specially aim at the website, the users themselves. So this type of attack occur when a website allows user-generated content to be included without proper sanitization, therefore enabling attacker to inject malicious script into web pages viewed by other users. So when you put that code, that XSS, your intended user is not the website, is not the company, it's the users on the, of these companies. So in an XXS attack, XSS, the attacker's goal is to execute the malicious script, the program, in the browser of anyone who visits the compromised web page. So the script can perform a wide range of actions from stealing session cookies, which could allow attackers to impersonate the victim and gain unauthorized access to their accounts because you get their cookies, to redirecting the victim to phishing sites or other malicious web pages. A simple example would be, suppose you are on a social media website where user can post comment and an attacker posts a comment that looks like a normal but comment, but it includes some hidden code. When you view the comment, or especially if you click on it, it could run code on your browser without you knowing. And this could do something like sending your social media cookies to the attacker with your cookies. Um, you, the attacker could log in as you, access your messages, post as you, or steal your personal information. And this is what XSS is. Now let's talk about something called race condition. A race condition occur in a computing environment when a system or application depends on the sequence or timing of events to operate properly. So the way it's programmed, it's, it's based on sequence of events. So one thing happened, then the other thing happened, then the other thing happened, step by step. So attackers exploit race condition by deliberately causing event to occur out of their intended sequence. So you don't do B until we do A. So you will let it, you will trick it to do B before it does A. Or simultaneously do A and B steps at the same time rather than in a controlled sequential manner. This exploitation can lead to unauthorized access or fraudulent action within the system as the program flow can be altered or manipulated in unforeseen ways. And Jürgen, I'm going to show you an example that truly um, illustrate this race condition. So in essence, a race condition arises because the outcome of the processes or operation becomes unpredictable to the concurrent execution. So they're not waiting. So you cannot execute B until A is executed. But however, A and B are being executed together. That's the problem. So the race is happening at the same time. So this unpredictability can compromise security, lead to data corruption, or cause other unintended consequences. So I'm going to show you a classic example of this. So a classic example could be exploited by an attacker in a banking application. Well, what do you do with banking application? You take, you can withdraw money. So um, let's think of an application that processes withdrawals by first checking to see if you have enough money in your account, then proceeding to take the money out. So the application checks the account. If the account has $500, the user requests to withdraw $300. Well, the applications verify the account that has that it has sufficient funds. Now, before the application deducts the $300, the user exploiting the race condition quickly requests another $300. So the application checks the balance again, which is technically still 500, because the first withdrawal did not finalize and approved the second withdrawal. So this what happened is there was a race condition here. The application processes both withdrawals as valid because it did not properly serialize. Serialize mean, means going step by step to check and withdrawals the operation. First check, then withdrawal. As a result, the user withdrew $600 from an account that has how much? 500. What does that mean? 
<laughs> you took more money than it's authorized. So to prevent race condition, developers need to ensure that operation that should be performed in sequence are properly synchronized. They are performed in se sequence A, B, then C. And this could involve using something we call locks, semi-force, or other concurrently controlled mechanism to ensure that critical sections of the code that access shared resources are executed simultaneously, not <laughs> executed simultaneously by multiple threads or processes. So each one is processed first, stop, until the next step occur. Where could this happen? Sometimes if you are re reserving a, uh, uh, a hotel or, an air, uh, or a, uh, a seat on an airline, what happens is this. They tell you the seat is available, but as you are reserving the seat, they'll tell you by the time you get there, it's not available anymore. Why? Because at the same time, someone else, a multiple thread, already did it. So what they did in those situations, the system is working properly. So as, as soon as that seat is taken, as soon as that room is taken, that's it. You are not allowed to be able to reserve that because the race condition is working properly. If it's not, then the same room will be booked for, or the same seat will be booked more than once. Now let's take a look at various viruses that we need to be familiar with. There's something called override virus. What's an override virus? Imagine you have a notebook where you have written down your favorite re recipes. Well, an override virus is like a mischief friend who, come over, who comes over, finds your notebook, and scribbles over your receipts with, the, with their own receipts for a dish that you don't like. Well, what they did is <laughs> removed your receipts. So the original receipts are gone, and if you want a clean notebook, you'll have to tear out the ruined pages, losing those receipts forever. So this kind of virus, when we say override virus, what it does, it deletes or override the content of the infected file, which often result in the loss of the original contact. To remove the virus, you have to remove everything, so you lost your favorite recipes. Multi-parted virus or party virus. Think of this as if you have a garden <laughs> and this virus really like a sneaky weed in your garden. It doesn't just grow in one spot, it spreads both above ground, attached to multiple plants, below ground, interwining with the roots. So it's all over. This makes it really tough to get rid of this because you have to fight it on both fronts simultaneously to fully remove it from the garden. Multi means more than one place. So this employs various methods to infect their host. They can spread by infecting both the, both the boot sector and the file, making them particularly virulent They can spread by infecting both the boot sector and the files, making them hard and difficult to eradicate since they attack multiple parts of the system. Let's talk about parasitic virus. Well, imagine if you gave a friend a piggyback ride and instead of just going along for the ride, they started grabbing things from people's backpacks as you walked by. So this is what this, is what this virus is all about. It latches into a legitimate program and when that program runs, the virus gets to work doing things it should not, like stealing data. This is also known as a file infector virus. It attaches themselves to executable files and are activated when the infected program runs. These viruses operate with the same permissions as the application they infect, potentially allowing them to perform unauthorized actions on the system. Now let's talk about the polymorphic virus. This is like a chameleon that changes color to blend into the surrounding and avoid detection. So a polymorphic virus changes its appearance, its code, every time it moves to a new computer, making it hard for antivirus program to recognize it because it's changing, because it never looks the same twice. So a polymorphic viruses can mutate their own code or signature pattern to evade detections by antivirus software. They can change their appearance with each infection, making them difficult and challenging to detect and remove. Resident viruses? Well, think of a resident virus as a sneaky guest who hides in your attic or in your basement without you knowing. Even though they're not making noise, they're still in your house. They're still in your computer memory, popping out to cause trouble, which is infecting files whenever they want, 
even if you think you have got everyone accounted for. There's someone there. So resident viruses install themselves into the computer memory, allowing, it, allowing them to execute even when the original virus source is not running. They can intercept system operation and spread infections to other files. Let's take a look at this multiple choice question from farhatlectures.com. Which of the following is an effective defense against SQL injection attack? Which one is ineffective? So it's going to help us protect ourselves. Is it, is it using complex password for database access? Well, what is the purpose of the SQL injection is not allowing us to input a code. Well, using complex password, it doesn't help with that. That's the input. Do, they don't prevent SQL injection. Using complex password, it helps the users that's using the database because their password is harder to crack. Well, but that doesn't help with SQL injection. A is out. Employing input validation and parameterized queries. Would that help? Would that solve the problem? What is SQL injection? SQL injection is when you input some sort of an input, a code, that that forces or allows you to do certain thing, certain things you're not s supposed to do well if you employ input validation and you put parameters on queries certain queries they're not acceptable yes you're not going to be able to do that so b looks like a good answer but let's wait installing antivirus software on a web browser well it's a good practice but doesn't help preventing sql injection sql injection is basically asking the database to do something it's not supposed to do, to do through an input. Well, antivirus software don't protect for that. It's good to have, but it doesn't protect, it doesn't solve our problem. Limiting the number of users with the database access. No, the, you could have one bad user. Limiting the number of users does not address the database vulnerability. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Once it's protected, you can have as many users as you want. And if the, if the database is not protected, even one user can infect. Therefore, as we, as we guessed, the answer is B. B is correct because validation and the use of parameter queries are a direct method to prevent SQL injection by ensuring that input is properly treated as data and not as an executable code. So the input that you're putting only can retrieve data and cannot be used as a code to manipulate, change, delete, or make any alteration to the database. What should you do now? You want to go to Farhat Lectures, practice MCQs as many as possible. This is how you'll pass the CPA exam, Information Systems and Control. Invest in yourself. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.